you have an esteemed speaker. So our uh, speaker today is our own Patrick Shannon. Uh, after majoring in mathematics in college, Patrick pursued a career as an information technology uh, exec, eventually retiring from a global company called Microsoft. Uh, immediately following the retirement luncheon, he went directly to the local airport and signed up for flight training. And he received a private pilot certificate at age 62, which I find very impressive. Mm -hmm. And his instrument rating at 71. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, he owned three airplanes, a Piper Archer, a Cirrus SR-20, and later an SR-22. Uh, a few years later, the FAA uh, decided he should maybe watch airplanes rather than uh, flying them. So he's, uh, he's now talking about them a lot. He's a docent at the museum as well. Since 2014, he, uh, he's been a regular at Bull Bull and he became a volunteer at the Palm Air Museum, museum a year later. He inherited the Old Bull Pilot website in 2021 and uh, kind of taken the reins of the group. Uh, and I think that's about it. So please uh, join, me, join me in welcoming my friend, fellow Old Bull board member, and our fearless leader, Patrick Shannon. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I just, this is like a pilot mic. You've got to have, really have a talk really close to it. Um, just a comment on that FAA issue. My cardiologist, it was a heart thing, and my cardiologist called it a, uh, well, how, what were the words he used? He called it a uh, stupid bureaucratic decision because I had on the same uh, the same medical that form that they looked at, I had uh, I had 141 percent on the treadmill. I, my performance was 141 percent of active my, males my age. And yet they still yanked my medical. Yeah, you know what they say, we're the FAA, we're not happy, so you're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. I have to make sure I get the correct button here. Uh, down. Down. Uh -huh. right. Down. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm not here to tell you about the, war, the Second World War, nor uh, to get into the specifics, <laughs> the specifics of closer, he says, um, the specifics of the uh, invasion of Normandy. Don't I don't want to go there. Uh, I, I'm really interested in the monuments, what's there today. And uh, if there are, are there enough of them, are they surviving? Are people going there? And so that's what we'll be talking about today. We're going to talk specifically about the uh, Imperial War Museum of the RAF at Duxford in the UK. Duxford's about 10 miles away from Cambridge, if you know where that is. And the American Air Museum at Duxford, great, great museum. Unbelievable how many airplanes they can get in a hangar there. And the Eagle Pub at Cambridge where RAF and US uh, AAF pilots uh, gathered and socialized and drank. The Churchill War Rooms in London, and uh, then the Nor Normandy and the Normandy and the invasion beaches. That's what we'll be talking talking about. And it shouldn't take more than a couple of days. Did that one out? Okay. Um, RAF Duxford was a fighter pilot base back in 19, uh, 1917. and. Uh, it, served as a fighter pilot base right through water, World War II. The, the Spitfire was flight tested there in 1938. And the, in the Battle of Britain from July through October of uh, 1940, Duxford was very heavily used because it was a fighter pilot base, fighter base. It was turned over to the United States Army Air Force in 1942, and uh, who also flew fighters out of that base. They flew P P-47s and P-51s. And I have had all kinds of people 
come up to me at the museum and uh, from the pe people who live in the UK and ask me if I'd been to Duxford, have I burned, been to Duxford? I got tired of people asking me that question because I, I wanted to say yes. And so now I can say, yes, I've been to Duxford, spent a whole day there. I was going to start off with a joke. Maybe I'll, this would be a good time to introduce it. I like starting off with a joke. And since Bob Lilac isn't here, I'm going to tell you one of his favorite jokes. <laughs> and uh, Bob, Bob, Bob asks the question, what's the difference between God and a fighter pilot? What's that? <laughs> a fighter, God doesn't think he's a fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> You get, you got that, David. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, at the at the present time, uh, Duxford is no longer an RAF base. It's operated by the Imperial War Museum. They have, I think, mu they must have a dozen Spitfires there. And I think most of them are flying, and the ones that aren't flying are going to be flying in the near future. Uh, it is Britain's largest aviation museum. They have nearly 200 aircraft, plus some military vehicles, um, artillery, and some minor naval vessels. No battleships or anything. But they do have a, uh, a cruiser, a World War II cruiser, that's moored in the Thames River. So I, that's hardly a minor naval vessel, though. And uh, there are seven main exhibition buildings at, at Duxford. So it's a pretty big, sprawling place. How many people have been to Duxford? Show of hands. Uh, a bunch of them. Uh, okay. I took a bunch of pictures of airplanes. I could have taken a lot more. In fact, I have taken a lot more. The ones I chose to put on the show today was this one of my favorites here is the Corsair and you'll see that it's in the markings of the uh, the Royal Navy or specifically the British Pacific Fleet. Uh, they needed a, a marketing rather, rather than the the rondel the British rondel with the red dot in the middle they didn't think a red dot would be a good thing to use in the Pacific. <laughs> So they came up with a, they came up with a white dot instead and a couple of white bars. So it looked a lot like the American uh, markings, but it had a, a dot instead of a star. And of course, the idea was not to uh, have our gunners shoot them down. Here's one uh, in post. Uh, this is a. Uh, uh, this is the a a a the F8F Bearcat, which we have one of those in the museum. This has got the post-World War II markings on it. And I believe it flies a couple of Spitfires together in another hangar, uh, a Hurricane, and I think there's a beside a P-51, and yet another hangar. The Spitfire and the Hurricane were the principal fighters in the Battle of uh, the Battle of Britain. And here's one, um, the Sea Fury, the Hawker Sea Fury that came into the war very, very late, like in 1945. Uh, it was delivered to the Royal Navy. And uh, great, uh, uh, gr great fighter, high speed, won a lot of uh, air racing championships, but uh, didn't see any action in World War II. Then we go to the American Air Museum at Duxford. Uh, it was built and paid for by the United States. It's just a, a very large hangar with 38, get them, 38 airplanes in a hangar. And uh, one of them is a B-52. So you'll, you'll see it. A picture, several pictures of that. Um, they, the museum also has a record of every aircraft, every American aircraft that went missing 
in World War II, having taken off from Britain. And there's 7,031 airplanes that never came back, which is kind of scary. Um, and they, they not just have, it isn't just a book full of them listing the aircraft. They, they have, um, they have an, a video on a loop that shows each type of aircraft and its model number and its tail number. Uh, so that was uh, quite, quite an important uh, feature of the museum. <laughs> This is one of the pictures that's taken from the upper level and you can see uh, a C-47, a, uh, uh, a missile, a drone, an SR-71, the wing and a fuel tank from the B-52. You can see a B-29 uh, B underneath the C-47. They show up all right on that screen. Yeah, it look, yeah. looks like it. Um, here we've got uh, B-17, um, a uh, B-51, a P-47, an SNJ dive bomber. SNJ, I'm sorry. Uh, what's, what's the, it's the SBD, sorry. Get my numbers mixed, letters mixed up. At the SBD dive bomber uh, up, up there. And uh, there's uh, the F, F4 um, with in, in uh, naval markings on it. And that might be a duplicate, or am I going the wrong way? Yeah, here's an F-15, F-25, an A-10. Ah, this was one of my favorite. This was one I just liked. It shows picture of the fuel tank, the drop tank that was made out of paper and plastic. Unbelievable that that worked at all, but it did. And the nice thing about it is that when the when it was dropped, it was of no use to the Germans. The Germans were short of aluminum like everybody else. And it'd be nice if we continue to use aluminum drop tanks, but those uh, really made a difference. And not far from Duxford is the Eagle Pub. And uh, a lot of people have asked me, have you been to the Eagle Pub? No, but now I can say I've been to the Eagle Pub and it's really a delight, huge pub. It's been there for 350 years as a pub. So they've got their, their, you know, their business is pretty well established. And uh, it, like I say, RF, RAF fighter pilots uh, started frequenting it in 1918 when the RAF was established. And uh, US uh, Army Air Force pilots started frequenting it in 1942 when they took over, the, took over Duxford. The sign says at the bottom, World War II graffiti. It says, drink in some history. World War II graffiti, uh, the, the discovery of DNA and uh, <laughs> resident ghosts that live there. They actually keep one window up so that the two ghosts who live there can get in and out of the pub. That one, one window is open upstairs. Uh, This is the ceiling of the pub, which uh, has been decorated by generations of pilots. Uh, the legend has it that a, an RAF flight sergeant named P.E. Turner, we don't know what P.E. means, we could guess, but uh, P.E. Turner, who uh, put a chair on top of a table climbed to the top of it and used his lighter to burn his squadron number into the ceiling. Yeah. And uh, that became a, a tradition for anybody who was sober enough <laughs> to, to get on top of the chair. <clears throat> yeah. 
And there are, yeah, it, yeah, maybe, it, yeah, let's, let's go back here. There are patches all around the periphery of the bar, at least the bar room that is called the F -A -R, the F R A F bar. The RAF bar has all, all of this uh, graffiti in it. And the, it is one of only, I think there's four different bars in, in the pub, but that's the big one is the RAF bar. That's the one we had lunch in. And um, there is writing on every uh, vertical surface, like, like this one here. In fact, here's somebody from uh, the Royal Air Force, somebody from the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, uh, on this, on the next one, somebody from the Royal Canadian Air Force. All of those names were probably went on or before, uh, uh, before or during World War II. Uh, went the wrong way here. Um, this, I got a kick out of this one. Once a night is never enough. And of course it was done by uh, a Marine Corps fighter squadron and uh, uh, night is spelled uh, with a K, K-N-I-G-H-T. Uh, <laughs> and this is the plaque that's on the wall celebrating the discovery of DNA, which was done in the Cavendish uh, Cavendish laboratory of uh, of the university and uh, by two guys who were frequent frequently had lunch at the at the Eagle pub and uh, they uh, J uh, Francis Crick and James Watson were their names Crick stood up in the middle of lunch hour on uh, February, 28th of February, 1953, and said, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? We have discovered the secret of life. And, and uh, I don't know whether the patrons stopped eating or stopped drinking or stood up and cheered or anything like that, but that's where it was announced that the DNA had been discovered. Was he a pilot? No, he was not a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that is uh, one, of, one of the things for which it is, uh, the pub is famous for. Uh, and, look, oh, keep going. The up button takes me to the next slide. Pardon me, the down button takes me to the next slide rather than the up button, which I would have expected. 50-50 yeah, chance. 50-50 <laughs> chance. And I keep messing it up. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, we're going to go to the Churchill War Rooms. I'd heard a lot about the Churchill War, War Rooms. And frankly, I was a little bit disappointed, not because of what is there, but how difficult it is to find your way around the place. It's really cramped. It's really... Uh, a bunch of uh, hallways uh, and just difficult to find anything there. I, I kept looking for the the uh, the map room. There was a sign for map room and I kept going to the map room and going in a big circle around corridors and coming back at the same place with the, seeing the same sign for the map room. And I never, I don't think I ever did get to see the map, map room. I found a photograph of it later, which I'll show you. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, only senior personnel had a bedroom there. And everybody else who had to sleep stay overnight, which if the, you know, if the Germans were bombing that night. People didn't want to go on the streets to go home. Uh, so they stayed, they stayed in the war rooms. They stayed uh, underground. And there was a six foot concrete ceiling on top of the war rooms. So they felt that they would do fairly well uh, if, if they were bombed. It was a pretty safe place to be. 
if anything was safe in London. And uh, so this is a small bedroom. You will notice there's a chamber pot under the bed. So the uh, you know what that's used for. Um, but the there was no no plumbing down there. Um, these are the guys who we know had bedrooms there. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Churchill and his five uh, general officer um, advisors. And so that from seated from left, uh, yeah, from left to right would be the head of the Royal Air Force, the head of the British Army, Churchill, and then the head of the Royal Navy. And the two guys who had to stand were both generals and they were they were uh, advisors to the foreign minister and to the defense minister. And I can't tell you which one was which, but um, they had bedrooms. Churchill's bedroom was a little bit larger than the one I just showed you. And I don't know whether it had plumbing in it or not. <clears throat> Uh, I think I told you that the everybody else had to sleep in this uh, area called what was it called the uh, the dock. The dock was a, I got to look into the dock. It's a, a set of very steep stairs that took you one level below, and uh, it had no plumbing in it at all. Just a whole bunch of cuts and uh, a couple of chemical toilets. So you can imagine it didn't smell that great all the time. <clears throat> These are telephone operators at work. Um, they had a, actually had a, uh, a mannequin, a couple of mannequins in the, the, time, the time we saw it. Uh, the Churchill War Rooms closed on the 2nd of September, 1945, which coincides with the date that Japan surrendered uh, on the decks of the battleship Missouri. You have to remember that Britain had, was fighting alongside us uh, in, in, in the Pacific. Britain and Australia was fighting alongside in the Pacific. And so uh, from that point of view, Britain was still involved in the war. And, the, and uh, British troops were also fighting in land battles in Asia as well. And that all ended that date. So that's, they locked up the war room, didn't take anything out of them, just locked them up. And they were reopened by Margaret Thatcher in uh, April of 1984. And for the first five years, it was administered by the Environmental Ministry in England and then uh, 1989, it was administered by the Imperial War Museum. And like I say, it, it's it's a great place to go and a great place to visit and a tremendous amount of history there, but it's a little tricky to get around it. Mm -hmm. Closer to the mic, closer to the mic. Pilot mic. I need a headset is what I <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going the wrong way. Let's go on to Normandy and the invasion beaches uh, and the 6th of June, 1944, and the 80th anniversary is coming up next year of the D-Day invasions. I took these pictures on uh, Gold Beach looking east You'll see the Sword Beach, where roughly it is. I don't guarantee that it's exactly where it is, but exactly the center of it. Uh, Sword Beach, where the British came ashore. Uh, Juno Beach, where the Canadians came ashore. And uh, then over here from Gold Beach looking west, uh, Utah Be Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. Uh, Omaha is the first one, and uh, Utah is on the other side of that headland. And these pictures, again, taken from Gold Beach in the middle. Now, 
we discovered a hotel called D-Day Aviators. Is that a good name for a hotel in Normandy? <clears throat> and I uh, had to stay there, just absolutely had to stay at D-Day Aviators. And I was not disappointed. You know, it's, it's an old, a uh, couple of old buildings is what it is. Uh, this one had two rooms, one down and one up. We had a downstairs room with a living room and then a, a uh, bedroom behind that. And um, the amount of memorabilia in that, it's a museum in itself. And I'll show you some of the things. But you'll notice in the front of the building, they have a, two pilots, uh, one a British pilot and one a US uh, pilot. And those two flags up there are not painted on. Those are, we're actually blowing in the wind, uh, the French flag and the um, Normandy flag, both, uh, both up there. Uh, when they said, uh, go back here for a second, you'll notice the X on the building beside the hotel. You see that, that's actually a steel X for reinforcing a wall. And so if you go to, the, you'll see the X on that building. That's how close we actually were to Gold Beach, which is just down at the end of the street, probably a one minute walk. So I think that, I, I was skeptical. I didn't know whether when they said it was on Gold Beach right on Gold Beach. I said, was a mile away, five miles away? No, it's a couple of hundred feet away. Inside the manor house, which was the building that had the, the hotel office and the breakfast and that stuff, it's a half, a half a block away from where we were staying. Inside the manor house, they have uh, the nose of the C-47 that came out of the English Channel. And uh, right outside, you'll see this propeller, and you can see it, see it through the window, actually. Uh, uh, this propeller, which probably came from the C-47 as well. And, uh, oh, in the, the cockpit, there are two folding chairs. Now, I don't think they used, uh, I don't think they used folding chairs in C-47s in World War II, but that's, we've got a couple folding chairs in there. So if people wanted to sit down and pretend they were flying the, the airplane, they could do that. And then there's all of these black and white framed photographs. Um, this one is of uh, five uh, British C-47s. British use the term Dakota rather than C-47. Uh, they call them Dakotas, but they had, there's five of them in that picture, all with markings of the Royal Air Force on them. And who knows, maybe the, our C-47 at the Palm Springs Air Museum may be one of the ones in this picture, but they had an awful lot of them. And ours at one time looked like that. I like this picture of the three nurses. Uh, these, are, these are nurses on their way to Normandy to, uh, to attend to the wounded and to uh, fly back with them back to the UK if they were being evacuated. And the two uh, nurses on the left are British and the one on the right is Australian. And then there's this photograph, which we do have at the museum, uh, of uh, WASP pilots delivering B-25s to the U.S. Army Air Force. They have a copy of that in Normandy. The Gold Beach Museum was actually the very first museum uh, that was built, um, focusing on World uh, on World War II and specifically the invasion. Uh, it's larger than it looks. It's uh, it's two stories above ground and one story below ground. And uh, it was the very first, as I mentioned, very first uh, one constructed and built. Uh, con they, it, they started work on it in, right after the invasion. The city uh, thought that they should do something 
to commemorate the invasion. So they started the museum and uh, they started it in uh, 1945 and it was uh, took 10 years to get the money and the design and everything done. Construction started in 1954 and it was totally refurbished in 2019. And the focus of this particular museum is the June 6th landings, as well as the artificial harbors. And you get a, a look at them here. There's a model of these artificial harbors in the museum. And you'll see um, on the farther out, you have the uh, what they call the mulberry breakwaters in the distance. These were made out of concrete, floated to towed over to uh, Normandy and sunk in place uh, to form an artificial breakwater. And then the roads consisted of a, uh, a pier and a road that, a floating road that takes you, a floating pier and a floating road that takes you onto the beach. And so, those are the three white lines you see in the picture, those roads. And this is a close-up of the roads, a couple of Sherman tanks on it, and the three trucks, I think, um, just driving us or going down a highway and getting off at the beach at the other end. So it was it was these it was these mulberries and these um at the other roads that enabled us to unload tons and tons and tons of material to, uh, uh, to each one of the landing beaches. Uh, we went to Point de Hawk, where they had a bunch of gun or several gun emplacements. I think there were four gun emplacements there. Uh, one of the one on the left isn't doing very well. Uh, it looks like it was bombed. Uh, the one on the right, the gun has been disabled, but the uh, the pillbox remains uh, in good condition. That's a hundred and twenty-two millimeter gun. So that look. And a little bit further along is Saint Mary Glees with the famous paratrooper. Uh, up on the dangling from the, the roof. Uh, St. Mary Glees was the first village liberated by the US, US forces uh, that day. And uh, the famous paratrooper is there, uh, was there on October the 15th uh, when we were there. So it's, it, it, I was under the impression that they only put the paratrooper up there on certain dates, like June the 6th and November the 11th. But in fact, uh, the, the paratrooper is there all the time. I don't, don't know if they take them down in the winter when it's, the weather's really bad, but anyhow, there he is. And the, the, guy, uh, the guy who became famous for doing that is one private John Steele. Anybody named John Steele in the room? <laughs> um, and it's very close to the Airborne Museum. The Airborne Museum, you can just up, step outside, you can see the church. It's St. Mary Glees. And um, it's like most World War II exhibits, you, things you'd expect to see. Here's a captured German flag and German uniforms and German guns. Um, this plaque, uh, I liked, I liked a lot. It was, uh, erected very shortly after the invasion. I think the, within a year of the invasion, this plaque went up and it's in uh, French and English. English is at the bottom, but it says in a grateful, grateful tribute to generals Ridgeway and Gavin, uh, and all of the gallant liber liberators uh, of our village. And 
and that uh, monument is still there. Some pictures from the museum of some uh, pair five paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division. And this one is from the 101st Airborne Division, specifically the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment. The C-47 building is new. It's been built in the last couple of years. Uh, it is really remarkable. It's got a, this, this stuff in it, uh, paratroopers in the C-47 and on the inside of their parachutes, they have uh, some animations. What really got me was going into the C-47 or the C-47 experience. Has anybody been through that? It's, it's okay, David had. It, it's fairly new. Like I say, that this was only put up in the last couple of years. Um, you go into a room that's total in total darkness, and then the door closes. When the door closes behind you, you you hear engine noise from the C forty seven, and still total darkness. And then the, there's a flash of light, and the flash of light is coming from outside the airplane, and it's triple uh, A that's exploding out there. And that illuminates the inside. And you look around towards that and you're surrounded by paratroopers. And it is really, really weird. <laughs> I mean, it is scary and it's disorienting. And, uh, and I guess scary and disorienting is pretty much what those guys were experiencing. But they do an extremely good job of letting you know what it was like to to be there. Down button. And then we'll move uh, on to the cemeteries. Uh, the American Cemetery is very close to Omaha, Omaha Beach. There's uh, 9,387 graves there, plus uh, the names of the uh, names on the Wall of the Missing, 1,557 names on the wall of the missing at that cemetery. And they get over 1 million visitors a year. It is the largest uh, number of visitors that visit any American museum outside of the United States. It, that's the big one. Um, Take a look at my cheater's notes here. Um, after World War II, uh, families of wanted their loved ones, many families wanted their loved ones to return to the United States and buried in the United States. And so uh, Congress appropriated money for that to happen. And during the 1950s, it happened. And um, two thirds of the those killed in Normandy were returned to the United States for burial. Uh, two thirds of them. So this number of ninety three eighty seven is merely the tip of the iceberg. Um, of course, not everybody agreed to uh, to uh, one of their loved ones returned, uh, but. The um, I had a brilliant thought here. <laughs> uh, uh, remaining in that cemetery today, so there were there were two twice that number effectively killed in Normandy. So the total. Uh, uh, Total of three times, there, twenty-eight thousand eight hundred would have been killed uh, in Normandy. Two thirds of them, and two thirds of them are back in the United States. Um, oops, wrong way. Um, also. 
Also in the cemetery, there's a lot of school children visit that cemetery. French school children visit that cemetery. And this is a bunch of uh, French school children the day that we were there. But three, a few minutes earlier, a few minutes, half hour earlier, uh, there were about a hundred French school children in uniforms. And there were three different groups were all wearing blue uniforms with, with, with slightly different uh, in, in three different groups. So the one group uh, had about, I guess about 30 people in it, 30 kids in it. The next group had about 30 kids in it. And the, the last group had about 40 kids. So it was about a hundred kids in total. And during taps, they were absolutely still and silent. I've heard I've heard complaints about how French school children act, and no cemeteries, but I, I certainly didn't witness it that day. Uh, we also uh, went by the Canadian cemetery. Any Canadians in the room? <laughs> um, the Canadian there are two Canadian cemeteries uh, in in Normandy. Uh, one is this one near Juno Beach at Bene-sur-Mer. And there are 2,024 Canadians interred there. And they were all killed in uh, June and early July of 1944. Uh, there's another cemetery closer to Caen where there are 2,782 Canadians were buried. And they were all killed in July, uh, late July and August of 1944. And we went by the German cemetery there at La Camba. There are uh, 21,200 graves at the German cemetery. After the war, they moved, there were German cemeteries all over France and they moved uh, a lot of those, if not all of them, were moved uh, uh, moved to the cemetery at Normandy, this cemetery in Normandy. Certainly all the ones who were killed in Normandy were there. Apparently there were 80,000 German troops are buried in France, 80,000. So my conclusion after looking at these monuments that I was interested in seeing is that they, I think they're well, uh, they're doing well. People are visiting them, they're always busy. There's always lineups to get into them. Every place we went, we had to get in a line and uh, they're improving with time and they're, I think, becoming stronger, if anything. There's an awful lot of people, particularly French people who are interested, uh, really interested in preserving those monuments and preserving uh, the story of the, of the invasion. So any questions? Yes. Uh, how, how are the expenses covered for maintaining uh, those monuments? Is there is that? Yeah. Um, how are the monuments up? How's the upkeep financed? And uh, on the on there, generally speaking, the uh, you know the United States funds the American museums. The Canadian government funds the Canadian museums. The British government, in, in turn. Um, closer, yes, sorry. Uh, I need a headset. Um, but uh, there's an awful lot of work done by French volunteers and, and, and also in Belgium, all kinds of volunteers there too, who help keep the cemeteries looking good and, uh, you know, help with the up upkeep and just do it for free people and and none of none of them are 
virtually none of them are survivors of World War II. They're all young people. They're the sons and grandsons uh, and granddaughters of the, the people who were there. Yes. Given your expertise on this, how does does it compare with how Band of Brothers oh. portray the faith? Um, I am told that the Band of Brothers movie had the the best portrayal of what it was like to land at D Day. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't heard uh, any comment from that at any of those museums, but I, I've heard that the Band of Brothers is, if you want to see what Normandy, what it was like to come ashore at Normandy, watch that. It's, it's chaos. It's loud. It's dangerous. And even the small graveyard that I heard of the Mac is kept. The same as the Royal Graveyard. It has to be Yep. It's 80 years later, the place is kept up. And it's there. It's great to see. It is. So, Patrick, on this tour that you took, what was the one thing that surprised you the most? Ooh. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Help me out here. What surprised me? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would think. Uh, yeah, the the C forty seven experience would have been really up there uh, because that was the eeriest thing that I've ever been through. I mean, I you look around and it's total blackness, and then suddenly there's a bunch of paratroopers around uh, sitting down. With all of their war gear on, on their rifles, their packs, and they were they were looking straight ahead. They weren't joking. <laughs> yeah. That might have been it. Yes. It's interesting to me to have you talk about that German cemetery. You know, the French have had two wars with Germany. Yeah. Uh, is the German cemetery uh, offered to respect and upkeep? And what do you think the local attitude is? Well, it was neat and clean. Uh, you know, we didn't go go right through it, but the lawns were mowed and it was neat and it was clean. There was no there was no graffiti. There was no trash laying around. So it was. But I understand the German government does not maintain it. And it, it is maintained solely by volunteers. Solely by volunteers who live there. Patrick, it seems like a, a heck of a heck of a journey for you. It's a wonderful tour. And you visited a lot of other museums. And so looking at our museum, Palm Springs Air Museum, those museums, are there any best practices that C forty seven experience? The yeah. Airborne Museum yeah. experience that might you may, might be able to think about adopting here to try and you know, increase attendance and make it more lively. Well, that is a good note to me. I should explain that to Fred Bell <laughs> and see if I can get his interest uh, behind that because uh, that's how it happens at that museum. But uh, I I had a new fondness for the for our museum, the Palm Springs Air Museum. You know, at Duxford, most of the airplanes are roped off. You can't get too darn close to them. And um, and that's true of just about any air museum in the world. You can't get close to the airplanes. And one thing you can do at the Palm Springs Air Museum is tap on them and hear the sound of the aluminum. Feel the, lead it, the tail edge of the wings. How about flying? Do they have the old warbirds? Said we were going to store some more Spitfires. And when I was at Duxford 25 years ago, I, they were not dogfighting, but they were using aerobatics. Yep. And to hear that tone and know that the engines, the Merlin's going by, was fabulous, made me 
something, if, if not just a ride, so easy one, but it's, I guess that would only pay for itself, but something like that is kind of for textured experience for the visitors to the museum. I, I will bring that up with Fred at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The pub, the pub. Oh yeah. <laughs> I I probably had a second one. I don't, and I think that was pro was it. What do you think? I probably probably had a second one. It was it was good beer. Nice. <laughs> we had lunch there. We were there for lunch that day. Yeah. Mentioned the 80th anniversary coming up next year. Uh, are there special plans to emphasize that particular anniversary as distinct from uh, annual anniversaries? I saw that uh, I was on a number of websites looking for pictures, particularly uh, um, related to. Uh, well, pictures on all of the from all of the venues that we were at, but uh, I, certainly the French are preparing uh, special special ceremonies for that day. I know that. David. French were dressed up as Americans <laughs> and gave some all kinds of stuff. So every year, it's not just on a special identifier or eating or whatever, but there is, there's a whole lot of people. The other thing I would say, I recommend also the movie The Long Stay. Now, it's an old movie, but it's very, very damaging. And it takes in a much more than just the D Day, you know, Normandy and all that. It goes to the, you know, the Pace and Bridge. All the other con and all the other places they do that was, you know, bomb and very big part of it. And so that's very accurate. The longest day. Good. How are we doing on time? 9 30. Perfect. Right on. Okay. Patrick, thank you so much for a uh, great uh, talk. Sounds like a fabulous trip to a place that I'd like to say personally. Uh, like all of our speakers, uh, we have a poster over on the sign-in table. And on your way out, if you could go by and sign that, that would be a, uh, a framed uh, uh, item for Patrick to put, put on the wall. Uh -huh. uh, so please please stop by that, the, uh, the sign-in table. Also, if uh, anybody needs, needs Name badges like uh, these, you can talk to uh, Gary and we'll uh, get your name badge. Um, actually, I saw a, a kind of a cool old bold hat today. We may have to look, look at some other swag. So. <laughs> uh, it seemed like the logistics worked out pretty well today, having food, food in the other room um, and plenty of food. So hopefully everybody got food and coffee and all that worked out well. Uh, our next meeting will be on January 25th. Uh, right back here uh, with the 251 pilot that we talked about. Uh, yeah, let's see, anything else? Oh, uh, I, we're uh, hosting a uh, get together in uh, February uh, for the Rotary uh, Club for the IFFR, which stands for the International Fellowship of Flying Rotarians. Uh, so there are actually quite a few people in the uh, Rotary. Uh, that uh, fly, and so that's the uh, President's Day weekend. We have probably about 25 people flying into uh, Thermal. So uh, if anybody wants to stop by and participate, please uh, see Cynthia or uh, I. Uh, afterwards, we're going to take them down to the Air Museum and then be on our Red Team tour and uh, some um, social get-togethers with a bunch of fun, fun pilots and things. So um, I think that's it. Does anybody else have anything for the good of the order here? All right, well, thank you all for coming. We have about 50 uh, people today. We're always looking for more, so please tell your friends that are uh, pilots or interested in aviation. Um, and the RSTPs 
are important, so we know, know how much uh, food, so that worked out great today. So thank you again for uh, coming. Have a great uh, New Year's, and we'll see you next year. Yeah. 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 Yeah.